Where were you? I was on BBM. <laughs> I was on my BBM oh, sending messages. Oh, when, so cool, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Data yeah. was it's still like 59 <laughs> rand for the entire month. Welcome to Trading SA. It's Thursday, and that means that we are quarter two. Segu nani to the weekend. And the trends and topics are locked in. And we are here to save them. I'm having so much fun. The we are here to save them. Hot and sizzling tonight. Some call me my play. I don't know who calls me shady, but mm. others do. But those who truly know me call me the emperor of Umlazi. And to help me run this town are two of my loyal subjects. Rifilwe mm. and more flavor. I'm ready to serve you, my leader. Thank you. The emperor. <laughs> Ego. Engaka. So now I'm just a subject. All right. Wow. On that note of defiance, let's get to top trends. We're going to start with something very important, uh, which is to send our condolences to the family of uh, the outgoing Auditor General of South Africa, Mr. Kimi Makwetu, um, who has passed away. We know that he served the country incredibly well for over 13 years in the office of the Auditor General and uh, was one of the country's most respected public servants. So uh, we thank him for his service and of course we thank his family for lending him to us and sharing him with us and uh, we thank him for being a true patriot. Our thoughts and prayers do go out to his friends and family and colleagues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed and uh, this week we've been following the hashtag Breckenfell situation very closely after the violent clashes that erupted outside the school premises on Monday. I mean, we saw parents, we saw residents and even some members of the political party, the EFF, come to blows. I mean, this ongoing tension has sparked racial socialization debates across the country. It really has been the talk of the town just reverberating throughout our nation this week. Yeah. Mm. As always, a former public protector and a professor of law and chair of social justice at Stellenbosch University, Tulima Donzella used this opportunity to weigh in on this debate with these tweets. She first said, stop the violence. It is wrong. The law must take its course. Let the children learn in peace. There's anxiety already without drama. As at public protector, I had to deal with the interruption of children's learning by people who were not learners. It was painful for families. And then she also went on to say, we are better than this, South Africa. We have a legal system with court interdicts, etc. On learners aggrieved by exclusion from a private party, there's a time for everything. It's exam time now. Let children write without the stress of angry strangers in view. Hashtag Brackenville High. So her remarks didn't sit well with tweets, and they took to social media to mm -hmm. voice out their frustrations. And Tulima Donzella joins us on the line to clarify her Twitter post under the hashtag Brackenville. Mm -hmm. Hi, Professor. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Thank Claire. you. <laughs> Thank you for the privilege. And hi to the whole team. It's Thank a you privilege so much. to see you again. <laughs> she greeted the emperor and the whole team. And the rest of us. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Oh well, Oxalayo, we, we're on the same page when it comes to the red. So <laughs> thank you so much for your time this evening. I think essentially what I want to um, premise or pre preface our discussion by is you were the public protector and now I guess you are more or less a private citizen, right? Why do you why do you contribute to debates of this nature? Because inevitably it seems as though some Twitter folk are waiting with a brick in hand to throw stones, while some may agree with you. Well first thank you, Rafilia. I was a public protector long before I got a title. The greatest space where we need to be acting is the space of social accountability, which is citizens holding those in power directly. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're very vocal, uh, Prof, and uh, we've seen how often you tweet um, on the timelines. Sometimes you trend, and I don't even know if you're ever aware how often you trend. In this particular case yeah, with this tweet, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in this particular case, it would seem that uh, the general sense coming through from the comments um, wasn't very positive, you know, when you look at the backlash and so on. Some people saying, well, why didn't you rather use the same energy to focus on racism instead of uh, um, everything else you said in that comment? On racism. That's what I do for a living. Every day I say something about racism. My whole research is about racism, sexism, uh, misogyny, xenophobia. My whole research, my whole existence, since I left my post as a pub protector, is looking at all forms of bigotry. Mm -hmm. But 
justice is not just us. And I do understand that from certain people, when they're in pain, they think only their pain matters. If you want justice, you have to do a balancing. So going back to Breckenfell, firstly, my heart goes out to those who were beaten up, and some of them were women being beaten up by men, and, and those men should be ashamed of themselves mm -hmm. because uh, violence is never the answer, as I see it. Mm -hmm. We do understand that people are frustrated, but that's the same reason people beat up women at home, they beat up other people all over mm -hmm. the place in society. There is no time when violence is acceptable. Sure. So, Prof, the Breckenfell issue is multi-layered. There's issues of transformation, issues of um, racism, and there's issues of the way that we protest as a country. Mm. Going forward, how do we tackle those multi-layered conversations properly? I suggest that, firstly, we establish what the facts are. And after establishing what the facts are, we talk. If we can't talk directly, we get a mediator mm -hmm. to enable us to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And I believe that protest should really be the last resort. Mm -hmm. And certainly violence, which is the language of the disempowered, mm -hmm. should never have a place in our society. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Pro, uh, and I hope that you have put in your application at Rhodes to leave that university and go <laughs> teach at a more esteemed institution. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. My university is very esteemed, guys. Uh, and I do keep inviting people, please come to Stellenbosch. You will see the changes. How many universities have a preamble to the Constitution mm. at their doorstep? Ah, Prof, that's us. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Prof, suddenly you cut, you cut, <laughs> we can't hear you. Thank you so much. After the ad break, we speak to Professor David Musoma, the CRL Commission Chairperson. See you in a short while. Now, welcome back. You're still tuned into Trending SA. We're still unpacking some of the top trends that had you talking this week. Of course, churches are making headlines for the wrong reasons yet again, with recent arrests of the self-proclaimed prophet uh, Shepard Bushiri and the Nigerian pastor Timothy Omotoso being denied bail for the third time. It doesn't end there to add to the list that hashtag CRL hearings was trending this week as uh, Bishop Bafana Zondo appeared in front of the commission for the promotion and protection of the rights of cultural, religious, linguistic communities as uh, the CRL Commission with, uh, at rather, the CRL Commission with allegations ranging from rape, money laundering, as well as sexual abuse. Mm. So seven former members and affiliates of the church testified before the commission. One of the seven members who testified is actually Zondo's sister. And uh, joining us on uh, the line now is uh, the chairperson of the CRL Commission, David Musona. Good evening, and thank you very much for your time, Professor. And thank you, too, and uh, for you to take interest on these uh, very critical matters which affect uh, the lives of our people in this country. Okay, Prof, we have definitely been following all these stories and the CRL Commission hearings are underway as we speak with Pastor Bafana Zondo. Ne? Uh, briefly unpack this particular case. What have been the findings so far? Remember, what we have been doing, we call it investigative hearings. Mm -hmm. So in the investiga investigative hearings, mm -hmm. you don't have findings immediately. Mm -hmm because we have to give uh, um, Archbishop Zondo the right of response to the allegations. Mm -hmm. All what you have heard are allegations. Mm -hmm. They will only stick after we have spoken to him and had his side of the story. Sure. Okay. And of course, this whole week we have been looking at cases of this nature, and it's clear there is a crisis in, in this space. And we should be worried, as you said, uh, and watching this closely as South Africans. Talk, can we talk about the role of the CRL hearings um, and, and ultimately what this, uh, what 
will might transpire out of this? Can we see criminal charges, for instance, coming out of this once this process is concluded? In terms of our mandate, we have what we call a referral responsibility. Mm -hmm. When it comes to matters of criminality, um, sexual uh, harassment or sexual abuse, mm -hmm. we refer those to NPA or um, SAPS. Yeah. We have already referred, I think, five cases that have emanated from uh, Everton. Because in terms of our mandate, we cannot um, um, prosecute people. Sure. But we are responsible in terms of creating what is called a um, relationship, promotion of peace, promotion of rights, and the development of harmony, friendship, tolerance among religions. Mm -hmm. The challenge we faced is that among religions, instead of respecting the rights um, and um, the, the, the dignity of people, these are the things that people complain about. And hence, in our um, responsibility to um, promote, we have to make sure that these are attended to in order to make religious institutions a place of peace, of mm. hope, and a place of empowerment for mm. our people. Mm. I mean, for the past few weeks, we've seen the cases against the likes of Prophet Bushiri, Omodoso, and now, of course, even Bishop Zondo. They've been frequent in the headlines. I mean, do, the, do all these cases put pressure on the commission to push for regulation of churches? I mean, is it even possible to, to do this? And what would it take to make that happen? What do we do as CRL? We are encouraging that each and every institution must have a constitution. Mm. They must have a policy on um, sexual harassment, for instance. Mm. They must have a, a committees that are dealing with discipline. Anybody who crosses the line must be disciplined. Mm. They, there must be a situation in which these individuals are sanctioned by the churches themselves or the religious institutions. They must not wait for government to interfere or the police to come into this place. So we, 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 we deal with that. And also our responsibility is to come up with a database mm. of all religious institutions and leaders. Mm. But that itself is not a regulation. It's just to know who is where and doing what. Yeah. Mm. The challenge is in the house itself. Mm. Prof, we really thank you for your time and your insights this evening. And uh, we'll be tracking and, of course, keeping sight of the work that you're doing with the Commission. Much appreciated. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Right. So we are going to go to a quick ad break. And when we come back, we we'll catch up with internationally renowned television chef and author, Sibam Tongan. You don't want to miss that conversation. See you now, now. Oh, what a jam. Number one I know, right? all the charts. Yes, um, love um, it. But um, welcome um, back. Um, You're still um, watching um, Training SN, SABC 3. Deep breath. She has been dubbed a culinary goddess. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. Wow. No. She has cemented herself as one of the leading chefs in the world. Amen. Her dishes have catapulted her into celebrity chef status mm -hmm. with sought after recipes and scrumptious twists to some of our favorite meals. She has glided her way gracefully, not just onto our TV screens, but into our hearts. Sure. I mean, yes. this is, this is mouth-watering wow. stuff, yes. huh? Who's I mean, that from, from being one of South Africa's... Uh, uh, first shifts to have a cooking show on an international food network to releasing some of the best-selling cooking books. And if that's not impressive enough, mm -hmm. she was handpicked by the presidency to culinary direct and curate the VIP menu for the inauguration of our president, Cyril Ramaphosa. Come on. I mean, goodness me, it doesn't get Joan more juicier that. than that. Huh? <laughs> All right, she is an absolute masterclass and uh, she is Excellence personified. Let's welcome Usiba Ntongono. Good evening. Hey, girl. Hey. I'm shy. 
<laughs> that's that's an was, intro. That that's, was an intro and a half. Thank you we very had to much. Make, we, we had to have like a seven color kind of intro. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, I see my language. My language. Nice one, Mo. Thank you. Nice one. See, Thank you. But it would be remiss of us to not start off by congratulating you on what you call the biggest milestone in your career to date. Yeah? yeah. This week you announced you're now a case study at the Harvard Business School where they'll be taking a closer look at your career and what it takes to be a pioneer in the culinary space, uh, both locally and internationally. How did this happen? Give us all the tea. You know, I almost said, when Jesus say <laughs> yes, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> Literally, I, I did not apply for it. Mm. I was, it was not even something that is on my to-do list. You know, I've got a to-do list of things I want to do before I die in terms of my career, mm -hmm. my life, etc. It was not on the list. Yeah. Mm. They came to me in 20, uh, two years ago, um, a, little bit, a little bit more than two years ago, and they said they wanted to do the study. I did not believe them. Amazing. I thought it was a scam. Mm. Um, <laughs> and then they came again. And then they came the third time and I say to my team, guys, let's just give this a bit more attention because they're quite persistent. And just in case it is something, um, you know, big and, and it is what it is. Yeah. So let's just give it attention. When I saw it, it was, <gasps> I literally <laughs> had a jaw dropping moment. Yeah. I could not believe it. It's, it's just, oh. it's, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a believer and majority of people who follow me know that. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those God moments. Mm. It's a God moment. And what's, what's lovely is that I work hard. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I work hard, I grind, and, you know, I've worked really hard uh, throughout my career until now. And it is so lovely to get the attention of the most prestigious university <laughs> in the whole world. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. So, I'm still in awe. <laughs> so, but in your social media post, you said that you were going to fly in. Yes. Right? And then, uh, these travel restrictions. Yes. Then you had to tune in virtually. Yes. What did that moment signify to you? Like, how did it feel to actually see all of that happening? It was really surreal. Um, so first of all, they've been doing the study on my life for about two years. That's amazing. They really yeah. went in deep. It was not just me, but also they went in deep in terms of South Africa mm -hmm. uh, because they really believe they've got, you know, they've, they've made uh, thousands of studies in terms of how, what makes a person succeed internationally. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that uh, they say is that where you are born, the time in which you are born in, has a very big influence mm -hmm. in your success, specifically globally. So they looked at me. They looked at South Africa. I was born in 1984. It was in the thick of, of, of up, uh, apartheid, or at least uh, going towards mm -hmm. us get, gaining our freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and then they had to look at all of that. They had to dissect me. I felt like I was an, a frog. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you did science? Exactly. And, yeah. and then you'd, t you'd pull apart every yeah. piece. I, I felt like I was a science project and there I was being pulled apart. So they, they spoke about South Africa. What are the chances of a black female in a male-dominated space? Sure. Mm. Not only in South Africa, but internationally. To crack yeah. it. And you, you must remember also, I think the beauty about it is that in America, um, my show is in over 60 million homes. Um, <laughs> Um, That's like the population of our country. Yeah, just by the way. Amazing. Just by the way. Homes. It's not even individuals, so sure. it's times the population of a country. And besides that, it's also um, n not only that, but it is in the cooking channel. The cooking channel is where the likes of uh, Rachel Ray, the Nigella Lawson, the food goddesses of the world. So when they <laughs> see me, they see that. Sure. Um, you know? sure. So for them, it was just a wonder because often people who do get um, to be recognized as such usually are. Africans from the UK or Africans from the US. But you're but from never. the streets. Like, <laughs> that doesn't and, 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 and here's the thing though, I mean, you speak about Harvard and yes. you being a case study. Yeah. More than anything, it means you're a brand, sure. right? Yes. So what, what is it about the Siba brand? What is the, the USP or the unique selling proposition? What's the, mm. the value, the brand value? Yeah. What is it that you summarize and define as the Siba brand? The Siba brand is authentic to herself or to mm -hmm. itself. When you see me, and I think that's the one thing that people relate to the most. Sure. When you see me um, in the streets, when you see me on television, when you see me anywhere, Dingusiba. Mm. 
Mm. It doesn't matter where. And I think people really feel drawn to that. I'm naturally a warm person. I am, uh, am, I, am I gloating? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> We are feeling the warmth in the studio. I naturally am you know, an, a, 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 a friendly person. I'm a hugger, so frustrated that I couldn't hug during COVID-19 sure, sure. period, etc. And also, I think a lot of people look up to me in many ways, not necessarily from those who are in the food space, but also people who are in other areas because I have managed to break barriers. Mm -hmm. I'm very driven. I'm very driven. I am resilient and I go for what I want. But I'm not a person, I don't like to talk too much. Sure. I like my work to speak for itself. Mm -hmm. A woman so, of action. I love yeah, that. Yeah, I'm a woman of action and I like to, it, it's almost like I don't have to explain why I charge this much. <laughs> You've Thank done you. it all. Um, 60 million homes you've cooked for our president yeah. and you know you still to cook for me of course i mean <laughs> she just hasn't announced that yet um Love of it. all the people that you've cooked for even all the celebrities yeah. that you've made dishes for who was the one that you were the most nervous about where you mm. thought i cannot drop a fork i cannot overcook anything here it's got to be perfect I think it was really nerve-wracking to cook for the president. Really? It, yeah, he mm. is a foodie of note. So one of them, my main dishes was a uh, was a salmon, and he just said, "Siba, I want it lightly seared." And I was like, "Sir, there's, you must also remember, you also have other um, African presidents who may not appreciate it as raw as you <laughs> like it." You know, so people like that, people I look up to, mm. people whom I I esteem, but also to reverse it, my kids are my greatest critics. Mm. I will make the most amazing amazing food and if the pea touches the rice or the yeah. whatever mm. it's just war you know yeah. so they are you know there's the there's the people i look up to and then at home there's my people that i cook for every day <laughs> that i so, need to make sure that i hope uh, our finance minister tito mboweni has your number because I think if there's one number he needs, it's yours. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Is that the energy that you want to end this? I'm not going to say anything. Oh, my God. Well, thank you so much. You are an absolute masterclass and uh, you are an inspiration. Mm -hmm. And uh, carry on doing the splendid work that you're doing. Thank you, Mo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you it for having me on the show. Awesome. Hang out with you. It was you. amazing. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, so uh -huh. that's the wrap. My goodness, is this the end of the, is this the No, end that's of the, the end of the tender. Oh, that the is, tender's done. Oh, right. Well, wow. listen. The tender is done. <laughs> that We're is done. it. Thank you very much to the uh, Trending SA team for tolerating me and allowing me to take care of the seat. We got to thank you for hanging out. There, yeah, Mo, well, listen, really, really you were incredible. Thank you were entertaining. You are special. Don't let anybody, you are you's important as well. Don't <laughs> let anyone ever make you feel any other way. Thank you. You were yeah. kind. See, but you heard that, right? You I heard that. that. You <laughs> heard that. Heard that. <laughs> so on that uh, affirming note, uh, as Mo said, Alma Kapawa will be back on Trading Essay from tomorrow. And we do have a dose of inspiration from amputee dancer Mosa Mota and the founder of the first black woman-owned studio, Tandi Nlauli. You don't want to miss it. See you tomorrow, 6 p.m. You know what to do. <laughs> Thanks, Ivan.